I have to click here because otherwise the pointer doesn't work. I got the trick. Okay. Welcome again. I'm glad to see that not many people have taken the opportunity to speak. Uh, so there we go. This was this high level overview of our Bella perennial architecture work. Now I'm going to, to go into the details of each of these blocks. And since I don't want to be over general, I will focus on the choices that we made for this implementation that we released, Neural ILL. Of course, we made those choices because I, we thought they were optimal. And yeah, in the afternoon, you will see that changing some of those significantly degrades the, the results, but uh, at the same time, just reflecting all those choices will give you the opportunity to understand which other possibilities there are. Let's start with the descriptors. This is an area that has evolved a lot from the first efforts by, by Bella. So the original descriptors encoded a lot of specialized knowledge. They were basically a set of Gaussians based on particular radii that they knew were the most favored uh, bond lengths, and they were hand-tuned to give us a uh, good descriptive power of the system. Over the years, this has evolved um, and, and diversified. There are many kinds of descriptors for molecules, for other kinds of atomistic models. But one of the most uh, productive um, descriptors for Bella perennial or fields for solids in particular, for periodic systems in general, the liquids or gases, basically consists in taking the density of neighbors around a particular atom. So in other words, we focus on each particular atom, I can place it at the origin of coordinates. And then we consider a sphere with a particular radius, and we call the cutoff around data. And we repeat this for all atoms, of course. And we define a density there. And here we understand density in the most detailed, most specific, and most literal context. So as a sum of delta functions place where the other atoms are, there is no broadening in this case. And then we define a set of functions, uh, a truncated basis, if you want. We project our density there to obtain the coefficients of a projection. And finally, we post-process those projections so as to erase the information about the orientation of the system of coordinates. Obviously, the information about the origin of the system of coordinates has already been erased at this point because we are only using relative position between two atoms. The only thing that remains is to erase the information about the orientation. There are several ways to do this. Uh, one of the main differences is which basis we choose. And in a particular case, we use the so-called second generation spherical vessel descriptors. And uh, I will explain in a moment why we made this choice. So the thing starts out uh, pretty, um, in a pretty standard way. We built our basis functions, the ones on which we are going to project the density as a product of a radial part and an angular part. And the angular part will be the spherical harmonic. So no surprises there. As you know, we can continue this to infinity. Those always define a basis for any function on the sphere at a particular radius. If we then multiply by um, um, by a radial part, we can literally parameterize every function. Only in this case, we are going to truncate it. The secret of the recipe is actually in how we build the radial functions, which will be a very special choice. We start from the spherical vessel uh, functions, but instead of taking just one of them, we take a linear combination of two for each radial basis function. And we parameterize that linear combination so that at the cutoff radius, the function, the first derivative of the function and the second derivative of the function are all zero. Can you imagine why that is an advantage? Well, you wanted to answer? Yeah. Okay. Basically, we don't want anything dramatic to happen when a particle crosses that cutoff, right? The physical description must be as smooth as possible, not only with respect to this description of the density, but also with respect to the derivatives of all the quantities that we parameterize based on those descriptors. So this is a super smooth descriptor set, and, and it will keep the physics invariant with respect to, to particles crossing that. We will never experience a discontinuity 
unless we go to very high order derivatives, which will be on shaky ground anyway. And then we take this first choice of basis and we explicitly orthogonalize it. So at the end of the day, we have a basis set, uh, a partial basis set, a truncated basis set, where any two members are always orthogonal, either because they belong to different angular channels, and spherical harmonics are obviously orthonormal, or because they belong to the same angular channel, but they have a different radial component, and those have been explicitly orthonormalized. So everything is orthonormal here. That is uh, very advantageous, as we have tested empirically by switching to a different um, truncated basis set, because it means that, in a way, these uh, descriptors don't encode uh, redundant information, since there is no overlap between those. And compared to, to other choices, uh, you can see that you need far fewer descriptors in this way. They, they are also relatively easy to calculate, because we can use ascending or descending um, uh, series to calculate the spherical vessel functions, and we also get the derivatives almost for free. So the, the basic advantages are these two. First, they are super smooth at the cutoff. Second, they are explicitly uh, orthonormal. Of course, after calculating the projection of the uh, density on, on these basis functions, we still need to do some post processes, as we will see. But first, I would like to show you what the basis functions look like. So if you are familiar with uh, quantum chemical calculations, if you have done things, for instance, with the EPO, or things when you are encouraged to, to analyze the basis functions, this will certainly ring a bell, even though they are not exactly the same there. And that is because we also use spherical basis functions quite often in those contexts. So the only uh, radial basis function that is not zero at the origin is the one with L equals zero, if only uh, to, to keep the, the smoothness. They decrease towards the cutoff radius as they should because of this um, because of this uh, condition of smoothness. And the higher we go in this angular order, the more maxima, the more minima, and the more nodes that we find. Also, as usual, and partially because of the condition of orthonormality, but not only. So because of the fact that we have explicitly included more zeros of the radial basis function. So when we combine this with the angular part of the basis function, what we obtain essentially is a very smooth read in the radial and angular coordinates. You can think about this as a way of a super smooth version of a histogram. We are trying to detect particles at particular positions and with particular angles between them. So if we start with the descriptor of the lower order, we'll see that this has very poor discriminative power, right? It's something that is uh, high for points closer to the origin. It decreases quite smoothly towards the, the cutoff, but it will capture anything no matter the, the angular position and, and the radial distance to the origin. Then as we go up in uh, radial order, you see that we have maxima and minima. So we are establishing a, a radial grid. No maximum or minima. You can think of this as more bins in a radial grid. Then eventually we will go to the next angular order. And now you see that we have two lobes. So this can discriminate between different kinds of angular correlations. And we go up again in radial order. And of course, we recover that radial grid. Eventually, we go to the next angular order. And no surprises, we now have three lobes, et cetera, et cetera. So at the end, what we have is uh, a grid that can be as uh, fine as we want that uh, allows us to discriminate where atoms are in, in terms of angles and, and distances. So the only possible drawback a priori of using the spherical harmonics as um, our angular basis functions is that they are complex. Not complex in the sense of difficult, but complex in the sense of involving real and imaginary parts. Fortunately, once we do this bit of post-processing to erase the information about the orientation of the system of coordinates, which consists in taking the coefficients, all the coefficients for the same value of L, and, and doing the, the, the convolution over all possible values of n, that complex part disappears. And to actually calculate the descriptors, we never need to involve the uh, imaginary part. In fact, you won't even see the spherical harmonics there at all. The only part you see is the Janter polynomials, the part of the spherical harmonics that goes with the cosine of theta, and the whole formula is fully real. The only thing I would like to call your attention to here, without going into the details of the formula, are this w. If you remember, this comes from the weights that we have given to each different element in the original description of the weighted density. And what well, traditionally people have chosen different things for that, be it the atomic number, the atomic mass, the atomic charge, and, and whatnot. 
We simply don't use weights. What we do is to decouple these descriptions, these descriptors in terms of each pair of elements and feed those to the neural network and allow the neural network to freely choose the weights or, or to mix these descriptors even in nonlinear ways. So we had, uh, increasing the number of units in the neural network is quite cheap compared to calculating the descriptors. So that's never a problem. So just to give you another peek into uh, what the descriptors look like, let me show you this particular case. These descriptors have been kindly calculated for me by my colleague, Sebastian Michelmeyer. He has been doing work on hafnium oxide, that is hafnium, that you can see here. And this is quite a particular set of descriptors because they only involve equilibrium position. So the atoms are not displaced from their equilibrium configuration in this uh, phase of hafnium. What we have done here is to expand and contract the unit cell. So here on the vertical axis, you can see different values of the volume of the cell. Since the atoms are kept at their highly symmetric positions, every half new atom and every oxygen atom is equivalent. There is only one kind. So I have listed all the descriptors of hafnium and all the descriptors of oxygen for a particular choice of N max for its volume. So you can see that as the cell expands or contracts, well, at some point, the first nearest neighbors pass through the maximum of one of the descriptors, and you see these uh, bright white spots because that is detected by the maximum. Well, eventually, as we expand or contract, those go a, a little farther away from the maximum and they go lower. When they cross a minimum, you see these dark areas. And the, these descriptors are also very sparse. You can see vast gray areas here where you don't find any atom ever. Well, this is, of course, an extreme case because, again, this is equilibrium. But this is most often uh, the case that you find this kind of sparsity. Because after all, in a solid, there are privileged distances, right? Even in a liquid, there are. Uh, very short distances will never happen unless you have um, very high energies just to decide a case about that. But again, that's not a problem because the neural network can uh, uh, take advantage of this sparsity. And in the first layers, it will just discover the descriptors and don't matter and, and call it a day. So let's go on to this second part of the Bella Parinello architecture, the, the neural network. It's a very simple case of a neural network. Again, it's called a multi-layer perceptron or a fully connected feed forward neural network. You compare it with graph neural network, attention-based models, recurrent neural networks, even convolutional neural networks, everything that's come after this, this is uh, basically a, a toy model. Still very useful though, especially uh, for regression. This is actually an implementation of ideas that have been there more or less forever. If you come from, shall we say, general purpose statistics, this would be a particular application of what's called gradient process regression, which is a way to parameterize a highly nonlinear function in a way that is mostly linear. So we add some strongly nonlinear elements, but only where it matters, keeping most of the rest linear in a way that the model can still be trained without going through the hooks that having something like the form of React setup, where coefficients are all over the place, wouldn't take. So this is a neural network, which is just a composition of functions, is most often uh, described as a graph, a graph representing function composition. So here the data goes from left to right. You can imagine the descriptors going uh, into this input layer and then passing through the so-called hidden layers of the neural network and into the output layer. And these arrows signal how the result of one function, in this case, the descriptor generator, go into another function. And the important functions here are the so-called neurons that are the elements of these uh, so-called hidden layers, the ones that are placed between the input and the output. So what each of these neurons does is take all of its inputs, which are all the results from the previous layer, and then this goes only left to right, take a linear combination of those inputs with a set of coefficients called the weights, add another coefficient that is called the bias, and then apply a parameter-free and strongly nonlinear activation function and produce that output. Then all the outputs from this layer act as the inputs from the next layer, and so on and so forth. So the parameters to be fitted in this model are these weights and biases, the set of coefficients. And again, notice how this is mostly linear because those always appear in linear combinations plus uh, an offset, so affine combinations if you prefer that notation. And the nonlinear part itself uh, does not involve any parameters. There are also hyperparameters, things that are not optimized, such as the width and the breadth of this neural network. The width tells you how many neurons you have in one uh, uh, layer and uh, what we could call the depth more properly 
is the number of layers. And there are many universality theorems developed for this kind of approximation, telling you exactly what class of function you can describe with one of these. The first one, corresponding to the original perceptron, tells you that you can describe almost every function, quote unquote, of the subject to some smoothness condition with a single layer. If you make it wide enough, if you include enough, um, enough neurons in it. That is mathematically correct, the best kind of correct, uh, but not very practical because people later discovered that it is better to keep your layers relatively compact if you can add more of them. So depth is always more expressive than width in a way. The problem is that then training becomes more tricky. And uh, a good part of what I will show you after this involves how to fix that problem, how to keep training efficient and, and doable. Okay. So now let's talk about the activation function, that part of nonlinearity there. This is parameter free, but it doesn't mean that it is univocally defined. And again, there has been a lot of progress in this area. The original choices of activation functions in the original uh, proposal for the perceptron were sigmoidal in shape. They were either a logistic function like this, going from zero to one to a strongly nonlinear uh, region and saturating at the extremes or the centered version that goes from minus one to one that you can describe as the hyperbolic tangent, for instance. Uh, but then people realized that there were much better choices that improved uh, the training and the result. A popular one is the exponential linear unit, the ELU, that has an exponential part for uh, arguments lower than zero, plus a linear part for arguments higher than zero. And it is non-smooth at the, at the origin, at x zero. There is also the so-called uh, scale exponential linear unit that adds a couple of coefficients and uh, tunes them very critically for something that I will describe later. This is very popular and very advantageous for regression. But what we actually use in neural link is something even more modern. It's called the switch. Anybody knew about this activation function? No? So the cool thing about this activation function is that it was not designed by people. It was designed by a machine. It is itself the result of a machine learning model that we will implement it to scan a large set of possible activation functions. So the good thing about this is that it is smooth. So when we want to calculate physical quantities that depend on higher order derivatives, the switch will never let us down. Whereas if we use something like the cell, which is amazing, it gives results, we get kinks in the forces. Something displaces a little bit and then the force jumps. That is not something that we want, obviously. The main motivation for changing from the sigmoid, original sigmoid to this new class of activation functions is the fact that all sigmoid functions kind of by definition have the so-called vanishing gradients. If you go to very low or very high the values of the input, the gradient vanishes, it goes to zero. This is obviously not the case for the ELU, for the CELU, or for switch. This gradient uh, saturates approximately at one, and we will see in a moment why that is important. <coughs> okay, so we know what a neural network is, how to build it. Now, how do we change those coefficients? What are we trying to achieve? Well, obviously to change something that is accurate, that can predict the dynamics well. But what exactly does that mean? It can mean many different things. The most naive approach to this would be just to require that it reproduces the potential energy as well as possible. And to do that, well, we can go for the super classical choice of a least square fit, just like we do for a linear regression, right? So we try to find those weights and biases so that the mean square error of the predicted energies is as low as possible when we have the ground truth of the self energies. So this might look like a good idea, but as many things that look like good ideas, it is actually a terrifyingly bad idea. I cannot even begin to describe how catastrophically bad this is. There is an economics argument here, which is simply that we cannot get a good tank for the box from the DFT calculations. No matter how many particles we have there, we only obtain one energy per calculation, right? So there isn't much incentive to, to adding more particles there. There is also a semi-applied argument that as we add more particles, the energy becomes less sensitive to each of the particular positions, which is bad because we want to detect that signal and fit to it. But there is an even more fundamental argument that is seldom cited. That is that many of the processes that we have to generate the data actually tend to give constant energies. Think about it. Think about canonical molecular dynamics in the NBT ensemble. So we have a thermostat, right? So we know from statistical mechanics that the ratio between the standard deviation of the energies and the average of the energies decreases as one over the square root of the number of particles. That means that the more particles we have, the more constants our energies will be. And that is, uh, yeah, even uh, 
obvious from a functional point of view because we are extracting configuration from a distribution that is proportional to the density of states. This increases incredibly fast with a very high power of the energy because uh, that power is proportional to the number of particles. And then we have the Boltzmann exponential factor. This energy is extensive, proportional to n, so add enough particles here, and this is a delta. All the energies will be constant, and then you cannot train. You cannot train to So a better idea than that is to train on forces. This solves everything. We don't have this problem. And of course, we obtain three n values of the forces from a DFT calculation. I won't say that we obtain those three n values for free, because there is some calculation to be done. But since we don't need derivatives of the wave functions by virtue of the Hellman Feynman theorem, we obtain them routine, right? When you run a DFT calculation, most often you get the energy and the forces. So we can build uh, uh, a linear combination of the mean square errors of the energies and the forces with some coefficient that we can fix there. You get, want to get fancy, if you come from fundamental machine learning, you could call this Sobolev training because we are training in the Banach space formed by the function and its derivative. And there is neither here nor there. We are only um, running it as a heuristic. But we can do even better because think about it. Why are we using the uh, mean square error at all, even in linear regression? Well, the, the sad answer is because we wanted to use the absolute error, but we couldn't because there is no derivative of that, right? Everybody wanted to minimize the, the absolute deviation, but we couldn't. So why, instead of uh, using the mean square error, we don't use something that takes the best of both worlds? We will take something that behaves like the uh, absolute error when uh, we don't have uh, an analyticity problem, but that in the area close to the origin behaves quadratically, like a, like a mean square error. The way we can achieve this is by using the so-called log cos h uh, loss, which is a composition of the logarithm in the hyperbolic cosine. So this behaves linearly for uh, high values of the argument and transitions smoothly into a quadratic region close to the origin. What is the main advantage of using this? Well, basically, that it doesn't give an oversized uh, weight to outliers. This is a big problem with the mean square error. If you have a really big force because you have a configuration with two atoms that are close together, that will dominate your training completely. And that is bad, right? So we want to, to focus on um, reproducing a wide range of configurations. That has traditionally been a problem for training. People more or less remove those configurations by hand. Using something like this, you don't need to. And you don't need to use things like gradient clipping, which is also a very common in machine learning model where you set an upper bound to the gradient. Here you get that for free. And this is totally night and day when it comes to, to training. Well, so we know what to minimize. How do we minimize that? So maybe it's a good idea to, to go with the solution that a BFT program could use and use conjugate gradients or even things that use higher order derivatives, like the low memory uh, BFDS algorithm that tries to approximate the Hessian. Is that a good idea? No, that is, again, a terrible idea. First of all, because we can't. There are too many variables to apply one of those advanced methods. We want to qualify this a little bit because there are efforts in that direction nowadays, but they use more sophisticated um, approaches, of course but also because of a question of robustness, right? So when we minimize an atomic structure in DFT, we try to come up with a more or less reasonable first guess, and then we uh, run a local minimizer from there. But this, uh, for, for, to minimize this loss, we normally start from a completely random configuration. And what we don't want is to get trapped in the local minimum that is closer by, because it will be suboptimal, right? So you could think that what we are going to do is a discount version of gradient descent, and that this is an inferior choice. But if you actually try this empirically, you'll see that it is a far superior choice, not only because it scales better, but also because it will introduce a critical element of randomness that will avoid us getting trapped in a local minimum. And it will uh, let us achieve much, much better uh, minimum. This is called stochastic gradient descent. And what we do here is to split the training data in chunks that we call batches. They can be relatively small. We calculate the loss and its gradients for that batch only. And then we take a small step in the direction opposite to the gradient, towards the mean. This kind of minimization algorithm, be full batch like conjugate gradients or be it mini batch base like stochastic gradient descent, is often explained in terms of a, of a skier that is blindfolded, right? So he cannot see where the bottom of the valley is, but he can feel the local slopes and he can decide to ski in that direction. So that is more or less 
what we are um, doing here. The simplest thing we can do, of course, or that this skier could do, is to take fixed length step in that particular direction and try to get downhill. That would work to some extent, but just like uh, when you see when people explain the basic uh, gradient descent view, uh, you have a relatively narrow but long valley that will result in our skier doing a crisscross pattern like this, always in the direction of the gradient. And that, of course, is bad. So people have refined this basic idea. So several, several iterations. If you look at the machine learning mod, uh, paper today, you are more likely than not to find that they use the so-called Adam optimizer. It's by far the most popular, to the point that you will often see a publication proposing a new optimizer showing that it achieves a 4% improvement upon Adam and claiming that it's successful. Well, that is obviously a testament to the total Adam. So Adam takes two elements from previous optimizers and adds them on top of the basic recipe for stochastic gradient descent. Those elements are called momentum and RMS pro. You will see that the names people choose for uh, machine learning algorithms are not always optimal, but well, what can we do? So momentum we could also call inertia. So instead of just walking in the direction of the local gradient, we keep some memory of the gradients at previous iterations and we take an average. Only that average is weighted and those weights decrease exponentially the further we go into the past. So eventually we forget about that. The fact about that is, well, intuitively very simple, right? Instead of doing this, we will stabilize the direction along which we do a lot. So we will move toward the, the bottom of the valley. The second is RMS prop. And this consists in, in addition to keeping a moving average of the gradients, also keeping a moving average of the square of the gradients. And that allows the algorithm to be adaptive, to have an estimate of how big a step it needs to take for every individual parameters of these tens of thousands of parameters that we have in the neural net. And the combination of those works very well. But there's still a free parameter, right? Even if we have um, inertia, even if we are adaptive, we need to make a decision about how big a step we take, or, uh, because that will still be a prefactor in Adam. Again, the simplest thing we can do is to take a fixed step, what we would call a fixed learning rate. And that is what people do in 99.9% .9 of the machine learning postgres. But that is a big source of problems, including instability in training, things like overfitting for generalization, etc. Here I present what is considered the state of the art in variable learning rates nowadays, which is called the one cycle schedule. So along an epoch, which is the name we give to the period um, in which the training process goes through the whole data, so all the chunks, all the mini batches we have created, we start with a relatively low volume of the learning rate, then we increase it linearly until a point which is at the edge of instability. At this point, the training is almost unstable. Then we decrease it linearly um, along a period of the same length. And finally, in the last 10% of the iterations of the epoch, we drop it even further. So this is by far the most critical choice that we, we took for designing neural IFL. It really gives a lot of robustness uh, to the model, to the point that it is difficult to make it not train. Because by taking your model to the edge of instability, you really get out of local minima very efficiently. And also you get out of exponential instabilities quite efficiently. So one thing you will have realized at this point is that we will need uh, lots of derivatives. Not only do we need to be able to obtain the gradients of the loss if we want to walk in the direction opposite the gradient, but we also need to uh, obtain the forces as gradients of the potential energy if we want to be able to formulate the loss at all. And not only that, we have a loss that depends on derivatives, then we are taking a derivative of that loss. Second derivative is there. So how can we do that? Well, the most obvious uh, choice is to do that by hand, right? And by hand, I don't mean by my hand. I mean hiring a couple of PhD students and buying a whip and having them implement <laughs> the derivatives that they calculate on paper. So of course, debugging is horrendous there. If you add anything to your model, you need to start anew. Let's say that you change your descriptors. Well, think about all the works you have to redo with the first order derivatives. And what if you want second order derivatives, third order derivatives? Well, that is completely impossible. There aren't enough uh, 
PhD students that you can abuse to reach that point, right? And if you think that zero the derivatives are not necessary, think again. I have built my career of computing zero the derivatives because that's what you need to calculate quantum static, right? So since we are all for PhD students human rights, no, we are not going to do that. There is actually a concern in many practical implementations of PhD, if you think about it, right? The fact that there are many things you cannot do in quantum expression, that some models are incomplete, is that people uh, cannot extract the derivatives they need if they use PAW datasets instead of potentials and things like those. So second idea we can have, well, we can go to a symbolic engine, Mathematica, Maple, uh, take symbolic derivatives of our function and then tell those engines to generate C or Fortran code for us. No problem there, that will work. Problem is that code will suck. Uh, there are always many chunks that we can reuse for the calculation of the derivatives that we could extract directly from the calculation of the function itself. Mathematica won't do that. Try it if you want. If you don't have Mathematica, you can use SimPy, the, the free symbolic module for Python. You can see that the code it generates is horrible beyond your wildest imagination. So that is out of the question as well. The possibility, numerical differentiation. Well, you know how this goes, right? You use a stencil formula, you go variable by variable, you change the variable a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, you take the difference, you divide over the step. Problem is that it's very uh, fragile. It's difficult to get the right uh, displacement. It is also expensive and it grows more and more expensive the more variables you have. So what is the actual um, answer here? Well, so-called automatic differentiation which is a thing that has existed for a long time, but surprisingly is relatively unknown in physics where it could be uh, a revolution. And I would say straight away that if you will go out of this room with just one concept in your mind, it wouldn't be even be uh, machine learning, it would be automatic differentiation. I think this is the most revolutionary concept in, um, let's say, in, in the field of computational frameworks for, for physics in, in recent years. This has grown popular partially on the back of machine learning, precisely because of the need to compute gradients. But it is very, very useful as well. As well. So of course, as the name implies, automatic differentiation is all about getting the derivatives along with the function, right? It is uh, an algorithm to obtain derivatives. But this is not symbolic differentiation, and it is not numerical differentiation. What this is, is actually a very clever and systematic application of the chain tool, because the fact of the matter is that even the most complex potentials like these neural networks or kernel-based methods are at the end of the day implemented in terms of functions whose derivative we know, right? Here we have a lot of spherical vessel functions. We know the derivatives of those. And we have the chain rule. So if we're able to follow that function composition efficiently, which is exactly what uh, numerical differentiation does, we can get the functions and the derivatives with the thing that the derivatives are obtained with the same numerical accuracy as the function down to machine precision, and with a cost that is comparable to the function itself. To be more specific, automatic differentiation engines work in one of two modes. There's the so-called um, direct mode, in which what you calculate are not the derivatives, not the Jacobian, but actually the product of the Jacobian of the function with a vector from its tangent space, the Jacobian vector product, and the reverse mode, in which you calculate the product of the Jacobian with a vector from its cotangent space. Each of these products comes at the cost of an evaluation which is similar to the function itself, which is incredibly fast. So those of you that have been following here will immediately see that with reverse mode, for instance, we can obtain the uh, gradient of a function in one go, because the gradient is a Jacobian with just one row. And with this operation, we can obtain the Jacobian one row at a time. So we obtain all the forces at the cost of an evaluation of the function. Think of how cool that is. So most machine learning um, frameworks only implement reverse mode. That is because they need that for back propagation for the gradient distance. But more modern approaches, the ones that are most useful in, in, in physics, also implement forward mode. When I say this is revolutionary, I, I really mean it. This is not just for machine learning models, but really change the way in which we think about the potential energy surface. This is not just a function we implement in code. This blurs the distinction between the geometrical object, the potential energy hyper surface, and our parameterization of it. And in fact, I would say that it blurs the, 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 the frontier between something like orbital 3 dft and classical potentials, once you have the derivatives, although we won't get into that today. And one of my favorite illustrations is how you can work with Taylor expansions of 
uh, any function, for instance, without calculating the coefficients of those Taylor expansions. Uh, the way we can achieve uh, high order expansions that were completely impossible before. That is because every term of this Taylor expansion you can obtain through nested application of the Jacobian nested operator. So you can evaluate this high order Taylor expansion in a way that stays linearly with the number of points at which we want to evaluate it without never ever getting the tensor of high order derivatives, whose number of elements obviously increases geometrically. So this method always wins in the end, and we have been using it to deal with molecular clusters, for instance, uh, in a very uh, efficient manner. Another area that I have not included here, but I would like to mention, is phonon calculations. So you know, phonons are, uh, roughly speaking, normal modes of periodic structures. Uh, normal modes of non-periodic structures we will get by diagonalizing the interatomic force constant matrix, but for phonons, we need to first represent that on a basis adapted to the irreducible representations of the translation group. So we need to diagonalize the so-called dynamical matrix, which is roughly speaking, a Fourier transform of those interatomic force constants. So long story short, we normally obtain that as a literal Fourier transform. We obtain the force constants, then we transform that into Fourier space, we diagonalize. But with automatic differentiation in using uh, a Jacobian vector product on top of a vector Jacobian product, we can obtain the dynamical matrix directly, because that's actually uh, one derivative in another basis. So we can obtain all the phonons at a given Q point without passing through all those intermediate steps. And that also brings this workflow much closer to something like density functional perturbation theory. Again, blurring the lines. Anyway, um, enough now um, about automatic differentiation. Back to uh, our activation functions and the problem of vanishing gradients. Now we know how to calculate those gradients. And we know that to obtain the gradient of the loss, but we need to apply Adam at the end of the day, we are going to chain a lot of individual derivatives of those activation functions. So if any of those derivatives are zero or close to zero, we are dead. We are not going to be updating our coefficients at all. That is what's called the problem of fancy gradients. And now you see why it affects deep architectures specifically, because in those cases, we are nesting more functions, right? So it's more to uh, all in this trap. One of the things we can do to avoid that is to use modern antivection functions like the switch whose derivative does not go to zero. But this is still not a perfect method. That is only part of the solution because the signals flowing between layers of the neural network can still be in a non-optimal area. We want them to be here most of the time so that we can take the optimal advantage of this uh, non-linearity in the neural network. How can we do that? Well, using a set of techniques called normalization. And the goal of normalization is basically to keep those signals around zero and with a standard deviation of one, some other value. There is a very clever approach to that, which is to design our nonlinear activation function in such a way that it preserves some characteristics of the input, like the mean and the standard deviation. And that is actually what those black magic coefficients of the cell do. They have been chosen so that if the inputs are a standard Gaussian distribution, the outputs are a standard Gaussian distribution too. So if you use the cell, you don't need to do any uh, extra normalization, which is pretty cool. But we still wanted to use the switch because it's good. So we need to add some normalization in between layers. So we take the output of our layer, we normalize it before passing it to the next layer. There are many ways to do that. You can normalize the data batch by batch. You can normalize it uh, in groups, divide every batch in several groups and do that. But we instead use layer norm, a technique coming from recurrent neural networks. So we take the data in each layer and normalize it. We cannot do that for the input or for the output because we would be losing the actual norm of the descriptors or the actual order of magnitude of the energies, but everywhere else we do that. That changes the result a lot. We can grow our neural network in depth arbitrarily. We never fall into this trap of the vanishing gradients. Right? So putting all of that together, we obtain this neural IL model, which we originally developed for ion liquids, but now we are applying to the surfaces and, and solids a lot. You can see everything I've talked about here and even an extra element here, which is the so-called embedding layers. You have been paying, paying attention, you will have noticed that I never really mentioned the atom at the center of each environment, right? The information about the chemical nature of that atom is not in the descriptors, if you think about it. Now, is that necessary to train the neural network? Well, that is questionable. In many systems, the atomic environments are very characteristic of the atom at the center. So you have an organic system, if I tell you that you have four hydrogens 
And at the tetrahedral configuration, you know that at the center of that, you probably have a, a carbon atom, especially if you know that the distances are compatible with methane, right? But there are other systems like, let's say, a silicon germanium alloy, because germanium is just a very heavy isotope of silicon as far as the chemistry goes. You want uh, where the chemical environments are not that characteristic because the, the bond lengths are, are very similar. So to allow the neural network to discriminate between those, we add the so-called embedding layer on top of the descriptors. And this is just a set of floating point numbers taken from a table and trained during the, the process that identifies the, the central line. This is fully differentiable end to end. So the good thing about this is not only that you can extract forces, you can also extract Hessians, dynamical matrix forms, and you can use those or parts of those in your training as well, because you can put them in the loss and take the derivatives without the need to ever have um, PC students sacrifice their lives to get the fifth order derivatives of anything, right? Okay, I, I think I, I will still need uh, 10 minutes or so, is that okay? Because we started with some delay. So, how do we use the data we have to achieve this training using the processes we have? Well, we need to split it in two or three sets, at the very least two training, validation, and test. Training data is data for which we have the ground truth, and that we will use to calculate those gradients. Validation data is data for which we also have the ground truth and that we will use to assess the quality of the feed at every step to see whether we are improving or not. And test, well, is anything beyond uh, training and validation. It can be the, the long molecular dynamics trajectory that we generate or, or anything else. And there, by definition, we not necessarily know the ground truth. Of course, if we could afford to run the DFT calculation for everything we have there, we wouldn't be parameterizing the potential in the first place. So why separate in training and validation? Well, it turns out that if we use the training data itself to assess the quality of the model, we could run into the so-called overfitting phenomenon. We have a poorly transferable potential that can describe the training data very well, but generalizes very poorly. So in a typical correct training with no overfitting, the loss for the training and the validation or any other statistic will evolve more or less in parallel, like this. Whereas when you have overfitting, it will look something like this. At some point, the um, model will keep on improving as far as the training data is concerned, but it will start uh, well, to do it, not improve anymore or even to diverge for um, the validation data. And let me tell you a secret. By adding all of this one cycle and normalization and so on improvements over the general recipe, it is very, very hard to get this neural network to overfit. In fact, this one is photoshopped. I have to take this, this plot, open it in Inkscape, pull the line up to, to, to make it look like it was overfitted. Whereas if you remove some of these measures, it will overfit very quickly. If you train only on the energies, you will find that after 20 or 30 epochs, the error in the energy validation will go to infinity very happily, uh, while the error in training will go to zero. That's it. Okay, uh, so that is it for training, but we still have a number of hyperparameters like the depth or the width of the uh, neural network there that we would like to choose, right? And that we cannot do using gradient descent. So what do we do instead? So just like we do when converging, let's say the cutoff energy in a DFT calculation, we could think of creating a grid of those parameters, trying a few values, uh, splitting the data in training and validation, uh, evaluating one of the uh, statistics in validation and see what choice is better. Mm -hmm. But that is very fragile. It depends a lot on how we split the data among test and validation. A better option is to do what's called cross-validation. And this is a particular table of that. So we split the, the training uh, data in subsets that we call quotes, and we train the neural network n times. And in each of those n times, we exclude one of these quotes. And that quote, we use for cross-validation, so we assess the quantity there. So with this, we get much better statistics, and we can actually see which value of those parameters works better. This is pretty much the standard. Of course, at the end of the day, once we have decided which parameters to use, we still train the model on the full training set and, and obtain as good statistics as, as possible. Now, the, the last thing I would like to touch on is how to assess the quality of our predictions. This is uh, a critical point because at the end of the day, we are not worried about how well the model performs on the training data, not even how well the model performs on the validation data. What we want is to know how well it performs when we actually put it in production. How good is our molecular dynamics trajectory 
are we falling into some instability for the trajectory that diverges critically from what the ab initio molecular dynamics trajectory would be? Is it nonsense? And of course, we don't want to evaluate the ground truth. We want to avoid the DFT calculation for those long trajectories and a lot of atoms at all costs. So how to do that? Well, there is this uh, traditional narrative about interpolation and extrapolation. You will hear a lot of times that machine learning models are very good at interpolation and very good uh, and very bad at extrapolation. And when you are interpolating, you are safe. When you are extrapolating, uh, you are in, in muddy waters there. Well, let me tell you, this is nonsense, unfortunately. And don't take it from me, of course. I'm a nobody. Take it from Jan Lecun, one of the fathers of uh, modern machine learning, which has pretty strong opinions on the matter, as you will see if you listen to any interview with him or take a look at this blueprint from, from last year. So the long and the short of it is that in high dimensionality, interpolation is impossible. Interpolation literally never happens. You take the convex hull of your input data in high dimension, that is such a tiny fraction of space, the set of all convex linear combinations, that you will never choose another point in there. That has vanishing probability, okay? Not only that, but with a neural network, we are applying nonlinear transformations of the data all the time. So where are you supposed to measure whether you are interpolating? In the coordinates, in the descriptors, which have a completely different convex hull, between the first and second hidden layers, or between the second and the third? So what even is interpolation there? But it's still true that we can rely to an extent on how similar the data uh, on which we are evaluating the model is to the data we use for training. That's not in this interpolation sense. At the end of the day, the right question is, if I were able to train my uh, model an infinite number of times, what is the probability that it would describe a particular point correctly? So what is the uncertainty uh, that remains there? And there are many ways to tackle that problem. We saw one yesterday, uh, which is using a, a different model than neural networks with uh, Bayesian kernel-based methods you can uh, get an estimate of the uncertainty, which is very nice. But today, of course, I will focus on those that can be implemented using neural networks. So um, a popular model used to be Bayesian neural networks, where each width and each uh, offset is no longer a number, but it has a distribution. That has been proven to overestimate uncertainty by a lot, and that is because you need to rely on the fact that they are uncorrelated. I would say that the state of the art nowadays are the so-called deep ensembles, and those combine two ideas. First, decision by committee, where you train several neural networks and look at how much they disagree. And second, a heterostatistic loss, a loss where data have different weights, depending on whether the network judges that they are easy or hard, okay? Starting with the committee idea, this is a figure from the neural IL paper, where we didn't use deep learning, we used some much simpler idea, the so-called subsampling aggregation, which is closely related to bootstrapping, that you might be more familiar with. So essentially, we split the training data in several subsets. We uh, train several neural networks to look at how much they disagree. And this plot shows what happens to this um, uh, Ian um, ionic liquid system, in particular, to a, to a single oxygen nitrogen bond in this NO3 uh, ion when we stretch that bond, right? So here you can see the distribution of the training data, which of course is centered uh, around the natural length of that bond. And here you can see the comparison between the DFT data in orange, the ensemble average of that committee, and uh, well, the prediction of a classical force field, which is of course terrible. And, and along with the uncertainty, which is the shaded area. So you can see that the interpolation thing is more nuanced, right? So around the training data, you get good prediction, but you also get good predictions in a much wider range. So here we are absolutely extrapolated. There is no data point here. There is no question about that, right? And, and of course, if you go even further away from the training data, things get worse. Uh, so to, to implement that on neural uh, we switch to the full tip ensemble theory. And here we need to add a, a new concept. Uh, instead of just predicting the potential energy, we add two new heads to the neural network. They are called heads as opposed to the root, which would be the, the input layer. One of them predicts an uh, uncertainty in the atomic energy, which we, again, assume it's additive. The other will predict an uncertainty in the forces. And we also change the loss of every individual member of that committee, of that ensemble, to make it heterostatistic. So this is actually the negative log likelihood of a Gaussian, only since the um, 
the, the sigma itself is also variable. This is no longer just a mean square error, but includes an extra term. Of course, we could make this loss smaller by increasing the prediction of the uncertainty of each point, but then it will blow up because of this. So this, which is an uh, equilibrium. So we train each neural network independently to this loss. We are gradient flipping because as opposed to the log cos h, this does not include gradient flipping intrinsically. And then we take the decisions by committee by using a mixture of captions. And the results are pretty, pretty good. There's an excellent correlation between the estimate of uncertainty by the ensemble and the actual error compared to BFD. This was provided to me by another colleague, Raf Vansenberg, who's doing a lot of studies using neural link on strontium titanate surfaces, a perovskite surface. Here you can see the distribution of the error of the, of the forces uh, on, on a given configuration. Here, the prediction of the ensemble. The white lines are the 25th. Uh, 50th and 75th percentile, so the 25th percentile, the median, and 75th percentile. And you see that if we take, for instance, the 25% more problematic data based on this proxy, it is pretty much the same as the 25% more problematic data uh, according to DFT. In fact, there are only about 100 data points here out of a total of 8,000 data points in, in this plot. And these are all uh, test points, so none of this is invalidation, none of this are in test. And just to conclude, since our loss is also um, a differentiable function, instead of simply taking those points that are problematic and adding them to the training set, we can hunt for problematic points specifically. This is a rather cool idea that we discovered recently and that we are using really extensively right now. So what we can do is to formulate a function that combines the uncertainty about the given point that we get from the ensemble with the plausibility of that point, that for instance, in a molecular dynamic simulation, we can get from the Boltzmann factor, right? And by maximizing this so-called adversarial loss, using the same techniques that we use to minimize the loss of the uh, machine learning model, we can obtain points that are both likely and completely unknown to the neural network. And you can use those to supplement our training set without actually running, for instance, a true molecular dynamic simulation. So with this, we obtain very compact, very uncorrelated uh, training data sets that result in very efficient retraining for active uh, learning. Well, here I have included um, three of the most well-known uh, machine learning frameworks that people use to, to create this kind of models. Long story short, if you are starting with your own model, I would recommend starting with PyTorch, uh, the one by Facebook. It's very well documented, and very modern. But since I'm cool, uh, we will use JAX today, which is the cutting edge framework by Google with very little uh, documentation and a lot of big corners and, and plenty of pitfalls. But as you will see, it has an incredibly fast optimization engine and a super cool automatic differentiation code that we will put to very good use for physics. Whatever you do, don't use TensorFlow. TensorFlow is historically a revolutionary piece of software. I cannot overstate how important it was for the machine learning revolution, but when I attend uh, talks by Google engineers, they tell you don't use TensorFlow. If it just instead, it's just very messy. I know people who have resigned because they were assigned to maintaining TensorFlow code. And, and if you go to a machine learning symposium in a material science uh, congress, like the MRS, you will see that it is 98% PyTorch, 2% JAX, 0% TensorFlow. Same if you go to a deep learning. And that's all here. And there are some pointers to more advanced domestic models that I encourage you to produce. Sorry for abusing your time a little bit, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.